the challenges of source evaluation in science and correlated areas. You're welcome. I'm Irina Lopatyuk, and I should say the great honor for me to be your moderator today. And so please allow me to introduce our dear speakers and guests right in the order they're given the floor. So the first speaker who I believe is joining us right now is Dr. Jeffrey Brian West. He's the theoretical physicist, former president of distinguished professor of the Santa Fe Institute. He's the author of several books, among which is Scale, the Universal Laws of Growth, Innovation, Sustainability, and the Pace of Life in Organisms, Cities, Economies, and Companies. He is a visiting professor of mathematics at Imperial College, London, and an associate fellow of the Said Business School at Oxford University. So, welcome. Our next speaker is Dr. Alek Maltsev, author, criminologist, psychologist, photographer, and investigative journalist. He is an academician of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences, founder and director of the Memory Institute and the head of Expeditionary Corps, which regularly conducts field researches around the world and has a unique library of thousands of film photographs and old treatises and manuscripts. Dr. Maltsev is an author of numerous books on the areas such as applied history, sociology, depth psychology, philosophy, criminalistics, criminology. He is an editor of several interdisciplinary peer-reviewed journals. You're welcome, Dr. Maltsev. Our next great speaker, Dr. Atina Karatsugiani, professor in media and communication at the University of Leicester. She is currently principal investigator for the European Commission Horizon 2020 project, DGGEN, the impact of technological transformations on the digital generation, leading the work on ICT and the transformation of civic participation. Her research has focused on the intersections between digital media theory, resistance networks, and global politics, investigating ICT use by social movements, protests, and insurgency groups. So you're welcome. Our next dear speaker is Professor Michael Minakov, Professor, political philosopher, editor. His major philosoph philosophical investigation focuses on human experience, social knowledge, political system, historical consciousness, and multiple modernities. Editor in chief of Canon Focus Ukraine, Canon Institute. Editor in chief of Ideology and Politics Journal. You're welcome. Our next great speaker is Professor Maxim Lepsky, Doctor of Philosophy, Professor, Chair of Department of Sociology and Administration of the Parisian National University, Head of Research Board in Social Forecasting, Sociological Association of Ukraine, Academician of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. Welcome, Professor Lepsky. One more speaker, our dear guest, uh, Doctor of Philosophy Vladimir Skvarets. Doctor of Philosophy, Associate Professor, Head of the Department of Sociology at the Parisian National University. He is the author of 115 scientific and methodological publications, among them two monographs, The Life of People as a Social Phenomenon, Transformation of the Socio-Historical Organism of Ukraine, Analytics of Social Processes. And one more speaker we're going to have today is the journalist, researcher, the editor-in-chief of Granite of Science, the scientific and popular journal, Daria Tarusova. You're welcome. So let me please just in a few words uh, add certain things regarding the reference terms of this panel. So each speaker uh, share the opportunity to answer two questions formulated, presented to you all in advance. So please limit the extent of your answers up to seven or eight minutes, no longer, please. Then we're going to start with a discussion on the first issue. Each expert shares his opinion, and then we switch to the second issue and discuss it afterwards. And just several more words about such minor but pretty significant aspects such as breaks. So we're not going to make any specific breaks, just in case you need to go to the washroom, to the bathroom, to grab a glass of water, you're free to do that. Please just make sure that your microphone is off. That's it. So I believe we can start. Yeah. So the very next, the very first question of today's panel is as follows. What makes a scientist? Well, you know that some scientists do not write monographs, but they are considered as such for different reasons. Is it articles in index journals or the quality of scientific works, for example, monographs that determine him as a scientist? So what is that? What makes a scientist a scientist? So 
Is our dear speaker, Dr. Br Jeffrey Brian West here with us? As far as I'm concerned, he's going to join us next. So by this moment, please let, 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 let me give the floor to Dr. Oleg Maltsev. Dr. Maltsev, you are free to speak. Я сегодня первый, получается? Да, окей. Спасибо, что дали слово. Thank you for giving me the floor. На самом деле, тот вопрос первый, который мы с вами будем как бы обсуждать, что создает ученого, он, наверное, самый больной как бы из всех, которые как бы существуют. Uh, probably the question that we are discussing today, what makes a scientist, is the most sensitive uh, question out of all. Ну, так как я человек нетолерантный. And since, uh, as I have mentioned yesterday, uh, I, I would allow myself to say that I'm not tolerant in the way it is perceived in today's world. Да, то я очень часто возражаю против того, что считаю как бы некомпетентным и, в общем-то, глупым. And I frequently openly express my uh, viewpoint uh, of disagreement when it comes to nonsense. И мы как философы, мы как бы должны понимать, что все в этом мире временно. And as philosophers, we should understand that uh, everything in this world is temporary. Да, поэтому как бы те требования, которые сегодня там предъявляются кем-то, кому-то, они как бы ученым человека не делают. That is why the requirements that are uh, set in front of academics, they do not necessarily make one a scientist. Да, то, что сегодня происходит, больше похоже на танцы возле священного тела науки. And what is going on today in the modern world of academia, I would metaphorically say that this is like a dancing uh, around the sacred body of science. Да, то есть как бы оценивать человека по количеству статей в скопусе это ну, достаточно ну, с моей точки зрения необъективный взгляд на, на ученого. And trying to assess a scientist based on the number of his articles that are published in index journals like Scopus, I think is not objective at all. Но я вот периодически общаюсь как бы с коллегами, слышу и такие идеи. And uh, sometimes I speak with colleagues and uh, I hear the views as such. Да, я, честно говоря, ну, достаточно часто заставлял себя читать скопусовские журналы. And very frequently I made myself read uh, Scopus uh, index articles. И мне вообще сложно себе представить, кто это вообще читает. And uh, to be honest, in most of the cases, it's very hard for me to think who really reads them. Да, потому что, ну, я там, честно говоря, не всегда вижу научную статью. Because uh, I don't see a scientific article always in the journals as such. Ну, я хотел бы напомнить коллегам, что наши с вами предшественники они ну, придерживались несколько иных стандартов науки. And I would like to remind to uh, our colleagues that our predecessors in the scientific field, they uh, looked up to a different values and different principles in science. Да, и никогда не было так, что какое-то книжное издание устанавливало стандарты в науке. And it was never the case when a certain publisher, let's say, uh, did set the standard for the academy in general. Для этого есть более авторитетные научные сообщества. The, there are more reliable and more reputable academic communities that should uh, play the role of setting the standard in science. Если вы помните, то доктор Юнг защитился, у него докторская диссертация, это 40 страниц. If you remember, uh, Dr. Carl Gustav Jung, he defended his thesis uh, with 40 pages written by hand. Вероятнее всего, как бы мы должны обращать внимание на содержание, а не на запятые ошибки и требования к отступлению от границ страницы до, э, так сказать, какого-то начала первой строки. What I'm trying to say is that uh, probably people should pay attention to the content of the scientific work 
and not be so obsessed with the commas and with the indentation of the format. I mean, the essence of the work, that is what is important. А теперь я вам хочу рассказать о том, как работают европейские старейшие научные общества и как создаются настоящие ученые. And now I would like to share a bit how old European academic communities work like and how did they create academic communities. И как это в Европе было всегда и продолжает существовать по сегодняшний день. So I will be sharing the way it was in Europe many, many years ago and the way it still continues up to this day. Да, попасть в такое общество, ну, желательно еще на в стадии студенчества. Uh, it is uh, it is the, the best choice would be to become a part of such a society when you are a student. Да, но я думаю, что там примером того могли бы служить хальдербергские общества. And as example to, to it, uh, Heidelberg academic communities is a good example. И, и, и прочие европейские научные общества. And other European communities. С, с хорошей историей, безусловно. With a good history. Таким обществом обычно 200, 250, 300 лет. And usually such communities uh, are 100, 200 years old. Да, мы знаем даже общества, которые с 1428 года существуют. And we know uh, communities that uh, existed even from 1280s. То есть в Хайдельбергском университете есть общество, которое существует с 1428 года. In Heidelberg academic community there is a community that exists from 1480s. То есть в такие общества приводят за руку, но это выбор человека. Certainly uh, not everybody can become such, uh, a part of uh, such a community. Somebody has to allow him to become so. But in a nutshell, at the end point, it's always about the choice of a person. Да. Я членом такого общества стал, когда я уже был кандидатом наук, ну, когда PhD уже был. I became a part of such an academic community when uh, I already became a candidate of sciences. Да. И, в общем-то, я имел возможность видеть изнутри, как это происходит, и вижу по сей день. То есть, как молодой парень или молодая девушка становится ученым, попав в среду знаменитых ученых. Uh, it's about how a young scientist, a young scholar could become a, a really important and influential somebody by uh, finding himself in the environment of professional academics. Ну, там, представьте себе общество, оно может быть от, от там, 15 до 250 профессоров. Imagine... Разные общества, у них разный размер. Since every community uh, has, a, have a, has a different number of uh, scholars inside of it, they range from 15 members to 250 members. Да, и безусловно, там существуют стадии как бы становления этого ученого. Они все как бы описаны, прописаны, и всем понятно, какие стадии человек должен пройти для того, чтобы стать доктором, профессором и уважаемым членом этого научного общества. And certainly those communities have their own guidelines as to what stages one has to go through in order to reach the level of a highly esteemed and professional doctor. И безусловно это невозможно без метра, без научного руководителя, без наставника. Needless to say this is not impossible without having a mentor. Да, потому что этот ментор его и приводит в это общество. Because uh, in the first place a mentor is the one who brings him to that community. Это большая тема, об этом можно говорить как бы бесконечно. It's a huge topic and we can speak on and on on this. Да. И поэтому когда мы как с вами говорим о том, что кто-то как бы в рамках какой-то университетской науки создает в своём университете какие-то научные требования как бы к тому, каким должен быть учёным, вероятнее всего они на это имеют право. And when we are looking at the modern state of affairs when it comes to different universities and, and academic environment itself, uh, them setting their own standards about how things should be, probably they have a right to do that. Но это не равно требования 
академического научного сообщества к ученым. However, those uh, separate regulations and requirements do not equal to the requirements of academic community to scientists and scholars. Это требование всего лишь какого-то университета. That would be just a regulation and requirement uh, of a specific university, let's say. Да, и поэтому ученого можно оценивать только одним способом. способом. О, по вкладу, который он сделал, то есть ту пользу, которую он принес обществу своими достижениями в науке. I believe uh, the most paramount criteria, depending on which we can uh, assess, let's say, a scholar or a scientist, is by what contribution he made to the society by means of his works. И никакие другие критерии оценки не могут э, быть применены к ученому по причине того, что все остальное это в принципе не имеет значения. So I don't think other criteria are relevant or, at all because nothing but contributions of a scientist matter uh, at the end of the day. То, то есть по сути с, какую пользу вы принесли обществу, так вас общество и будет оценивать. So it depends, I mean, uh, to put it simply, what kind of use, what kind of benefit a scientist brought to the society, uh, the society would, um, should treat him accordingly. So it's all about a contribution of the scholar. И еще два слова относительно потому, почему я достаточно скептически смотрю на индексовые журналы и на вот это слепое рецензирование и прочие как бы вещи, которые сегодня понапридумывали Странные люди, как бы. And I would like to say a couple of words why I'm skeptical about different scientometrics, uh, blind uh, reviewing, and all those requirements that are that many are so obsessed today with. Дело в том, что я был на в Голландии на конференции и видел очень неприятную ситуацию. There was one case uh, in the Holland when I was participating at the conference and there was a very unpleasant case. Там сложилась такая ситуация, что вышел один врач. So one doctor who uh, presented his speech. Да, он очень большой ученый в своей области. Who, who was a grand uh, expert in his own field. Да, и он задал один вопрос, кто хочет меня отрецензировать. He asked one simple question to the audience. Who would like to review me? Да, желающих в зале не нашлось. And there were no people, no volunteers who wanted to review his work. Я хотел бы посмотреть, кто отрецензировал бы профессора Интервинья. Для меня это тоже. Я бы посмотрел до этого ну, знаменитого человека, как бы. So just to give another example, what I'm trying to say that I don't, it's, it would be very interesting for me who would volunteer, let's say, to review or to assess Professor Introvinia or other grants. Я таких, я, я таких грантов могу назвать в мире не менее десяти. And I may list a, um, a grant, a master scientist as such, uh, min, uh, at least ten people as such. Да, получается как бы очень неприятная ситуация, когда... В общем-то, первые лица отраслей, как бы, они попадают в ситуацию, когда их никто не может отрецензировать, а не, то есть, по сути, не прием их статьи в журнал – это скандал. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, we take specific areas, and certainly we have representatives, the brightest representatives of those areas. And uh, sometimes the case is that there are no people that are willing or are capable or competent to review their works. And when their works do not get into the index journal, let's say, for different reasons, there is a scandal. То есть, по сути своей, вся редколлегия вместе взятая хуже этого человека разбивается, разбирается в проблематике. Как они могут его рецензировать? Imagine a situation when there is an editorial board who are less competent than a person who submitted the work, so they cannot even properly review that work. Да, и, и таких случаев, ну, масса сейчас. And there are numerous cases as such. А 
уже о случаях коррупции и прочих как бы вещах, связанных с деньгами и прочих. Ну, то есть я вообще молчу, потому что ну, не тема нашего разговора. And I'm not even speaking uh, about corruptions and other problems that are in the academia, because this is not the topic. Of our discussion. Да, и поэтому как бы я вот э, на любые оценки индексовые всегда смотрю очень скептически. And that is why for me any uh, metrics, any indexing, uh, I would treat it skeptically. This is not the only criteria to assess something. Ну и еще нужно помнить, что американской науки, британской науки, европейской науки у них разные требования ну к самой науке. And also, certainly, we should keep in mind that if we take academia in North America, in Europe, in in post-Soviet uh, area, they would all have different requirements and so-called unwritten rules when it comes to science. Поэтому это очень такой скользкий, деликатный и я бы сказал крайне важный вопрос, который мы сегодня обсуждаем. Therefore, the question. What makes a scientist is very sensitive and at the same time a very important question that we are discussing today. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Malsa, for delivering your speech. And by this moment, I'm glad to say that Dr. Jeffrey Brian West has joined us. So please let me give you the floor. And let me kindly remind you that we're discussing one issue, what makes a scientist. So please, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry I wasn't here at the beginning. Um, I had the uh, I, <laughs> I'm not uh, blaming uh, Kenny K, but I <laughs> I had the wrong um, uh, the wrong link. It uh, kept wanting me to be on tomorrow. It kept saying for the 26th. So eventually we sorted that out. So I'm now here, and unfortunately, also I have to leave early, so it's particularly um, annoying. But anyway, uh, thank you for inviting me. Delighted to be with uh, with with all of you. Um, I, I wasn't. Uh, I only heard the last part of uh, Dr. Maltsev's um, talk, um, and um, I wasn't sure when I read the question how exactly to interpret it. It seemed to me there were two possible interpretations, and um, uh, one was, you know, what are the characteristics? of a person that they become a scientist that they should have to be a scientist um what what kind of personality what kind of um, values do they have and so on that's one the other is uh, what i think may have been implied from what i just heard of dr Matsev, and that is um how is a scientist recognized as a scientist by the community um so um, I will try to address both, and I don't think I have anything very original to say, to be honest. Uh, so uh, I'm going to first address uh, what I perceive to be the characteristics of a scientist, and it's highly idealized. None of us, um, you know, when we, we have lofty ideals, very few of us are able to really realize them. But um, let me say at the beginning some of the obvious things. I think uh, something most fundamental, of course, is somehow to retain, as difficult as it is, that kind of naive, um, childlike inquisitiveness and curiosity about the world around, around us. Um, you know, why is the sky blue? Where, 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 what are the stars? Um, what, what is the nature of life? Um, why am I going to die, etc., um, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But some of these big questions that many of us have uh, when we're young children, when we're young adults, and uh, we then enter into a uh, academic career. And what unfortunately typically happens, of course, as you get narrow and narrowed down, uh, these big questions sort of disappear into the vacuum and you tend to focus on one thing. But I think that ideally um, a scientist, no matter how specialized they are, no matter what they work on, should always try the very hardest to maintain that uh, childlike inquisitiveness, as I say. And uh, indeed to always asking, you know, why, when, how, 
and uh, to seek a deeper understanding of, of many of the things around us and so to continually ask questions and uh, associated with that are two major things one is both very hard to do may i say to remain passionate to remain passionate about uh, these questions um, and secondly to have a dedication to truth uh, both of these are very difficult um, they, they always sound um, they're lofty ideals and they often sound simple but they're hard to do and in, associated with that means the willingness to be wrong to accept the, the uh, uh, conditions under which one has either proposed something and it turns out to be wrong um, or um, to be uh, skeptical not only of one's own work but of other work um, I think Einstein uh, once said something like, um, uh, no matter how many experiments are done, they will never completely verify any theory I have. However, only one experiment is needed to destroy my theories. And I think that's kind of, that's a very difficult, um, um, such, you know, that's a very, very difficult construct for all of us to accept. And that's part of what we accept when we become a scientist. Um, the other aspect of being a scientist, I think, is the recognition that it's not oneself, one is not on an ego trip, um, one is part of a community. And that relates, I think, to the second part of, the, of this question, at least my interpretation of it, and that is the uh, communal response to an individual's scientific contribution, and I'll come to that in a minute. But I think that's extremely important, um, that's, that's, uh, that, that we recognize that we're part of a community, not just in our immediate collaborators, but of course in uh, communicating uh, what we have learned, our experiments, our theories, our ideas, our concepts, to um, not just the scientific community, but to the broader uh, intellectual and, and um, uh, popular community. So I think that's that's crucially important. And I remind you another quote of a great scientist, uh, of course, Isaac Newton who made the famous remark, if I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. Namely, we all are interconnected and whatever we do is built necessarily upon what others have done. And we are just part of that whole process of, um, of uh, understanding the world around us, uh, the role of man in, uh, in the universe, the man on the planet, the man in his city, and the man, our woman, in their community. And that's part of this giving back uh, to the community in terms of the kinds of things that we do. So uh, part of that, of course, is that um, is, is always be willing to make hypotheses to uh, speculate, to um, always ask questions, as I said. And by the way, um, another very difficult thing to accept is there are no stupid questions. There are no stupid questions. All questions have some validity, and, we, and that's often very difficult to accept. Um, uh, and important in that, and important in our, in, in our reaching out is being able to articulate and that is a segue to the idea that one has to be able to present one's ideas. Uh, one has to be able to give talks, to write articles in journals, to write monographs, to write books, to write in newspapers, to write in magazines, and so on. Um, and at the same time, as I say, to be open to a critical response. And, um, uh, and the last thing, which I think is extremely important, is um, it goes along, and maybe I should have said it at the beginning, part of that passion and inquisitiveness is, I think, to remain resilient in the face of criticism and to feel that what you are contributing to is part of why man is on this planet and to recognize the beauty in uh, the scientific enterprise. And at the same time, to recognize that typically for most of us, the material rewards relative to many of colleagues that have gone on 
into business, into politics, into community, our rewards materially are quite small and to be able to accept that. Okay, now I'm going to segue a little bit to um, this question of uh, this other interpretation of the question, and that is um, uh, what makes a scientist in terms of the communal response, namely uh, this question of um, how does the community recognize a scientist? And again, I don't think I have anything terribly original to say, but it's clearly that um, it is the recognition within accepted, respected journals and, uh, and, and the writing of books and monographs and so on, um, and uh, the, the recognition by participating in conferences, symposia, uh, giving seminars and colloquia and so on. That is all part of it. But that raises an issue, which I think Dr. Mossev was focusing on, and that is that, of course, this relies on something that uh, we, that the community has sort of accepted as a norm, and that is embodied, of, of course, in the whole construct of peer review. Uh, and that is that there is a, um, uh, who decides, who is going to be the arbiter? We don't have um, kings and presidents of, um, of academic societies who um, say necessarily this, this person is a scientist and this person is not. That's not how it works. The way it works is by um, some kind of crowdsourcing in a way. That is that um, the community itself by a process of multiple feedbacks and uh, kind of almost a free market system is, is the idea is that that is supposed to lead to um, uh, someone designated and accepted as a legitimate, respected, and in some cases distinguished scientist. Um, and that clearly has flaws in it uh, because it's very clear that mavericks and people that think outside of the box that are on the edge, can be neglected, can in fact be vilified, um, because if we, I mean, they, by the way, they, if we all subscribe to the kinds of ideals I tried to articulate earlier, this would be much less of a problem. The problem is none of us can really live up to these ideals. So therefore, some people get neglected, uh, their work gets ignored, um, and uh, many times, or at least sometimes, uh, that work only gets recognized much later, sometimes after they're dead. Um, and uh, this, of course, is a, is a huge problem. And I suspect in many ways it's getting worse. That is the hegemony of the crowd or the hegemony of the, um, of the, of the structure. I mean, it's ironic as we have grown and, and essentially science like society has grown exponentially and the pressures, the pressures to publish, um, the pressures to get awards, to get uh, tenure in a university, to get a position, to get uh, some recognition uh, have become significantly greater, um, partially because everything is speeding up and partially because as more and more people um, have entered the fields, um, resources per capita have decreased. And so this leads more and more to um, um, a, a narrowing of the views. And I think that's something that um, is, uh, is, is, is quite serious. I can't speak outside of the United States, but um, one of the curious phenomena that, I, that has occurred in the United States that I would say has been developing um, progressively in the last at least 20 years is that as more and more administrators, university presidents, university provosts, um, uh, directors of uh, the national funding agencies, more and more they say, we want to broaden the scope of everything. We want people to be interdisciplinary, to connect. We're looking for people on the edge, people that are thinking out of the box. The more that is said, the less it happens. 
this is quite extraordinary. Um, and it's almost like, I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you know, the, the, uh, the more you, you try to locate a particle, the less you know its momentum. And here it is, the more you talk that we're going to be more transparent and open, and we want people that are uh, more speculative, the less it actually happens and the less they get funded. And um, it's, it's a very curious phenomenon. And it's, it's, of course, come about, by the way, because another phenomenon, and this one is a very delicate one, is that especially federal agencies in the United States have tried to become more democratic. And by that, what I mean is the following. It used to be, say, 40 years ago, that federal agencies in terms of making decisions, and this was even true in universities maybe 50 or 60 years ago, decisions were made much more hierarchically. That is, individuals would make a decision. I like this work, we're going to fund it. Or I like this person, we're going to hire him, we're going to give him tenure. And that was it. There weren't sort of multiple committees and bureaucracies and so on. Now we have all those. And the, the naivete was that by having committees drawn from the community, in the case of federal agencies, or drawn within the university, within, within universities, that this would democratize and we get a fairer result. Well, what that has done is push things much more towards the mean, that it had, has made the, 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 the successful scientist one that conforms to what uh, the uh, canonical paradigm is within that, those fields or within those sub-disciplines. And um, unfortunately, those on the edge um, get, in fact, further pushed out. Because in a committee, necessarily, almost necessarily, you tend to have decisions that are, of course, a regression to the mean. And those that are on the edge get left out. Whereas, ironically, if you have one or two wise people that's <laughs> making a decision, they will often say, well, look, this person's a little bit crazy, doing crazy things, but that might be really interesting. Let's get him, and so on. And uh, I'll, I'll, I think I'll stop here. I can cite, by the way, several examples in the past of great scientists that would otherwise have fallen between the cracks who have ended up being extremely successful, even winning Nobel Prizes, that had not someone 50 years ago said, you know, that person is hardly published, but he's doing really interesting things. We should really uh, uh, take a risk. So nowadays, we're very risk averse. And I think that's part of the issue. Anyway. So I'm sorry, I've tried to separate these two things, but they're obviously interconnected. That is what makes a scientist in terms of who the person is, the kinds of ideals and values that we cherish. Um, and at the same time, in a certain sense, how the reality and society and institutions respond to that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. West, for a speech. And by this moment, let me please give the floor to our next speaker, Dr. Atina Karatsugiani. Please, you're welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I like coming to um, your conferences because they make me think uh, uh, for a little while about uh, things that I don't take to think about very often because uh, I'm in some kind of um, rat race of get the next uh, funding in, article done, you know, like uh, do, um, do all this stuff uh, that are supposed to be part of what we're doing. It's a very highly uh, competitive um, environment. So, and, uh, and this has to do with uh, this, uh, as other colleagues mentioned previously, these um, so now liberalization, right, of the university, of academia, and of science in a way, right? Like what is funded, what is not, 
get funded. Um, people probably have uh, heard of this, make this funding application, like you're talking to uh, a 10 year old child and then it's gonna get funded because you have a clear kind of like uh, more clear uh, non-expert is be attractive for the person reading it because they will understand it and it would be risk averse the risk averse thing we should fund this because you know it's a simple simpler thing people will understand where the taxpayer's money is going so there is um, all this um, cutthroat competition also in um, the working environments in academia but uh, that, that didn't used to be like that, but it has uh, certainly become that in the last uh, 15 years, I think in particular, uh, which meant that we have less time. Uh, and I'm talking about my own experience. I'm in the UK um, uh, at the university in England, uh, but I have colleagues in other places that um, have similar experiences as well uh, in the Anglo-American sort of setting where we don't have time to do slower scholarship, right? So, uh, so we tend to um, have to work very fast and, and that causes a problem uh, in how we marinate, let's say, our ideas, how much time we take on the ideas. And um, that can have a problem in the quality of, of what we do. And it takes for a very stubborn person to resist the easy, kind of scholarship, fast and easy scholarship. And I think that is because we are professionalized and accelerated in ways that um, didn't used to happen, right? So there's like this uh, McDonaldization, let's say, of, of the university and how things are done at the moment. That is not helpful. Uh, but it wasn't like that. Like, um, it, it was not like that. Now we have a very specialized uh, competitive uh, scenario. So. Uh, that's one the immediate reaction I had to what other people said, um, but uh, my thoughts about it is uh, is that the scientist as a scientist it didn't come into circulation until some um, some guy like you know proposed it as a joke uh, more or less uh, in the mid nineteenth century right so before then who was doing science. Uh, you know, in the Enlightenment, before that, in the uh, in the Renaissance, you had all sorts of people doing what we now call science, like uh, uh, Galileo or Newton or whoever. And before that, I mean, the ladies, some of them were like were priests. You know, like they were like uh, there were there was not like an official kind of you are a scientist and you are not. And even before that, uh, in ancient Greece, it was done by philosophers, right? The pre-Socratics and so on. So it wasn't that it was a profession, like in the sense we understand science today and science today we understand it more in terms of medicine um uh, uh you know uh, physics you know like what are the nobel prizes there's one about economics that's the, the only like sort of human like sort of social science kind of science right so you could say that um who is a scientist today is a much more restricted kind of um uh, definition uh, and and when you look at the great scientists you know of all time um, you know like um, I don't know people talk about Einstein Marie Curie or Ada Lovelace or um, or um, Tesla or Newton or whatever what really is fascinating about these people first of all is that they are very confined to a specific specific type of fields what we call the stem fields right the, the sort of a science technology engineering those kinds of fields so the people that are doing social sciences let's say um or just of other sciences uh, like political science they're not recognized as scientists scientists right so there is like this um uh, demarcation of the scientists and these other guys that are doing the more social softer you know that are not doing hard science, they're doing the softer uh, type of stuff, right? The ones that are accessory to the hard scientists that are saving us from cancer or, you know, COVID or whatever. And the social science guys are there as accessories to talk about ethics, maybe, you know, where the little accessories are going to the, you know, the funding base so we can look at, we can make the hard scientists look ethical and critical and, you know, taking into account the impact on society and blah, 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 which I think is a very problematic thing, right? So uh, I was actually uh, recently thinking, how about we are the core 
and they are the, you know, the accessories, you know, those are the hard scientists, right? So there is a, a problem with how um, uh, scholarly work, right, and science is funded. Okay, and it was mentioned before. Uh, the other thing that I was thinking that was interesting about this um, was that when you do look, uh, there's two more sort of interesting things for me. When you look at uh, specific personalities, um, you know, that had been, uh, let's say, the giants of their fields or whatever. And, and what you see there is something uh, quite uh, uh, interesting, uh, that there is in some of these people um, psychological difference. Right, there is uh, neurodiversity. There are, in some cases, mental health problems that uh, are clear and they influence their work. Uh, and uh, it always made me feel that when there is a big sun, there's also a big shadow. Okay, so there are uh, uh, often uh, people that uh, are quite different. And how we tend to deal with people that are neurodiverse and different these days is because they are, they are not able to perform in the neoliberal university. We don't accept them because we are discoverers, as uh, uh, Jeffrey said, right? So you have a problem of you have great talent that is not in our universities because we cannot accommodate them, because they cannot do all the box ticking, you know, like all the things that these people with academia and the scholarly work, right? The, the world, they was accommodating them because they were so talented. But now because they're di they were difficult, we have difficulty basically managing these people, like, like including these people. So however you have all this equality, you know, diversity um, and, and disability discourses, right? In the university, the more you have those and the more you can see you cannot accommodate people that are uh, considered eccentric or some kind of syndrome that the, you cannot actually accommodate these talents because you are risk adverse, because you want fast results, because you don't have the patience for scholar, so, so for slow scholarship and, and so on so on and so forth. So I think that is the problem. Um, finally, uh, what I was thinking was about uh, uh, the fact that you have, uh, because of uh, 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 sort of the network world and some relative democratization on the other hand of this dystopia. Maybe there is uh, an optimism there that means that more amateur scientists and amateur people can um, find the resources they need uh, if they are lucky and they are supported by a network that can wait, right? Can engage with the difference, can engage with the eccentricity, right? So it's a matter also of luck for some amateur scientists like that then can enter the academic context and thrive in the academic context. If the problem is that the academic context right now does not tolerate the talent it used to tolerate. And I think, uh, uh, and I think that is something that is quite, it is important for me to say that uh, we don't have that uh, uh, tolerance for difference in some of the talent that we are presented with. And that is the same because we're losing out. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear professor, for your speech. And by this moment, please let me give the floor to our next speaker, Professor Mikhail Minakov. Please, you're welcome. Please. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Irina. Well, I would like to approach the, the same question a little bit from a different perspective. I look at science as a long living transcultural intellectual practice that includes exact natural and social sciences as well as humanities that has its own history and thus different historical forms. Among those are antique, classical and post-classical science forms. However, I argue that even though the ideals of science were changing and thus the meaning of science may seem relative, its core authenticity remained untouched and uh, definite. And all historical, in all historical periods, it was true to its genuine idea, adherence to truth. The antique science, for example, was open equally to mysteries, facts, logic, and mythological beliefs. In this period, methodology was easily mixing with rituals, 
like in the text of Democritus, materialist. Uh, for example, he was stating that uh, there is a direct connection between the fertility of a field uh, with the uh, with pregnant women making certain dance on the field. And he was explaining it in materialist scientific way. Democritus, as well as Plato, Aristotle, and Cicero, they shared same scientific ideal. The Genian science deals with what is eternally unchangeable and universal, like the foundations of mathematics and geometry. The ideal of universality was treated as, as the one that demands metaphysics. There is a fundamental division of the being on the world of ever-changing reality and on the world of eternal ideas that relate to the changeable world as its cause and archetype. And the knowledge of ideas and causes constitutes the true science or the art of wisdom. Uh, in many ways, the classical science, a thousand years, thousands of years later, uh, from Isaac Newton to Sklodowska Curie, was looking at the world as a united three-dimensional uh, universe with the casual relations defined as the laws of nature. Here, in this period, the genius science was seen in natural and in exact sciences, while social sciences and humanities were lacking the laws and the vision of united reality, and thus they were soft, weak. However, the classical universal ideal of science was constantly discussed between rationalist followers of Descartes and empiricists, including Bacon and Locke. Furthermore, uh, classical scientific ideals were constantly attempted to be applied to society and culture by Giambattista Vico or Immanuel Kant or Hermann Cohen or Wilhelm Dilthey. As a result of pragmatic paradigmatic change in the ideals, ideas and methods of sciences in the early 20th century, science has entered its brave new post-classical epoch. From Einstein and Bohr to today's uh, scholarship, we witness growing disciplinary divisions and interdisciplinarity. Understanding of scholarship as subjective and intersubjective labor, involvement of uh, relativity from methodology to cosmogony and doubts in eternity of the universe. So post-classical methodology is based on a worldview of torn, changeable and ever unfinished knowledge where truth is permanently undefined, uh, plural and unstable. I listed here three historical contexts with different understanding of science and knowledge, but in the, 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 there were much more these scientific communities and subcultures in different times and in different places. So science, even though it like, sounds like ideal uh, group, ideal institution, it's changing and it's unstable. It appears and dis disappears. We know Greece, antique Greece, and then Greece without scientific uh, community. So in a way, science per se is very unstable. However, it doesn't mean that the genuine, genuine uh, scientific ideal is temporar temporal and culturally uh, relative. The real solution to relativist doubts in science is in the paradigmatic understanding of science as co-presence of real and ideal scientific communities as once was offered by uh, Pierce, Charles Sanders Pierce. Here I continue Pierce's argument that science is an intercultural multi-generational practice, which was, is, and will be practiced as a community of humans relating their actions to scientific ideals of truth, argument, judgment, and universality. Basically from antiquity until today, we know about scholars, not science as some separate entity. On one hand, the community of scholars in all periods acts as if their conclusions are always universal and final. Without such assuredness, there is no meaning in science. But on the other hand, sociology of sciences show that 
uh, how fast the knowledge is different in different disciplines gets outdated. For example, in medicine, the knowledge changes every two years. In physics, every five years, etc. This duality of the scientific knowledge is rooted in the nature of humans, beings with rationality, emotions, and tendency to fight for power, also in scientific communities. For that reason, the ideal of eternal truth is being practiced together with limitedness of concrete individuals, groups, and interests. Here we always have dominant and marginal positions, which undermine equality of those looking for truth. But with time, the social deviation from scientific ideal is being rectified, and thus the science progresses on. So my conclusion is that the gene in science and scientists uh, is the practice that aims at universally established true knowledge that can be reviewed by any other rational being. But at the same time, gene and scholars remember about their limitedness and about the need to be ready for reworking on their research by themselves or by colleagues that may rectify their previously established knowledge. So if we don't make the peer review, for example, about which Oleg was in the beginning like making Philippics, the peer review is part of scientific process, but only if it's not fetishized as in Ukraine or in, in many other countries where bureaucracy tries to use this argument of peer reviewed journals, publications as an index of success or failure of a scholar. So in a way, th there are many deviations in contemporary scholarly uh, systems or scientific systems, mainly connected with the power, mainly connected with the governments that intervene and control uh, societies of scholars. So in a way, Genian scientist is also an oppositioner. It's also a person, a, a dissident in a way. And if you see the praises from the government in the form of like Pushkin uh, Prize or Shevchenko Prize, you really have to worry, what did you make wrong in your scientific work? I'll stop with this, thank you. Thank you for your speech, Professor Minikov. And by this moment, please let me give the floor to our next speaker, uh, Professor Maxim Lepsky. You're free to speak. Приветствую, дорогие коллеги. Хочу поделиться своими тезисами, но несколько с другого ракурса. Good evening, dear colleagues. I would like to share with you my thesis, but with another perspective. Мы как-то задались целью посмотреть, а как ученых воспринимают в обществе. Once we asked ourselves how scientists are perceived in society. И в массовой культуре. And also in masses culture. Оказалось, что образов ученого достаточно стройный ряд. Первый образ – это образ ученого-безумца, у которого в руках большая сила, полученная с помощью науки. And uh, we found out that there is certain images and we have a row of images. And the first one is the scientist who is some kind of madman who has his uh, power because of the science. И этот образ тиражировался, начиная от мультфильмов, заканчивая серьезными фильмами. Второй образ ученого – это был человек, который включен в какую-то сферу, но абсолютно не адаптирован к реальной жизни. The second image of uh, the scientist is the person who is included in some society, but he is not adapted to this society. И таких персонажей достаточно много, они очень быстро тиражируются людьми, когда их опрашиваешь. 
And we can say that such image of scientists is very popular and it's also very replicated by people. Третий образ был связан с культурой комиксов и массовых блокбастеров, которые сейчас запускались DC и Marvel. And the third image of scientists is connected with comic, comic book culture and blockbusters from DC universe and Marvel universe. И в этом случае ученый – это образ Тони там, Старка. С одной стороны живет одной жизнью, с другой стороны живет другой жизнью. And here, when we speak about this image of scientist, this is like a Tony Stark uh, who has two parts of life. He lives uh, as a scientist and also he has another part of his life. И вот этот спектр ученого дополнялся еще образами учителей и преподавания. And also when we speak about images of scientists, there are also another image, which is teacher, and it speaks about teaching. Более старшее поколение, которое формировалось еще в советском обществе, вспоминало совершенно другие образы ученого. Это ученый физик, готовый пожертвовать своей жизнью для достижения результата. And when we speak about the older generation in Soviet Union, for example, uh, we see another type of images of scientists. For example, this is a certain uh, uh, phys physicist who is ready to give his life uh, for the science. Второй образ – это был ученый, который находится в приключении, в путешествии. The second image of uh, science scientist is uh, a person who is also always in some kind of adventure. Кстати, этот образ восстановлен моим коллегой Олегом Викторовичем Мальцевым. And I have to say that this image of scientist was made by my colleague, Dr. Мальцев. Третий образ – это был ученый, который, невзирая на все трудности жизни, занимается любимым делом по призванию. And when we speak about third image of scientist, this is a person who not looking for some obstacles for him, but he is making his activity in science by vocation. У современных ребят, молодежи, образы научной деятельности во многом дискриминированы и дискредитированы. And when we speak about uh, young people who we have right now, uh, they have very strange type of image of scientists. We can say that they are kind of discriminated. Даже одно время мы пытались объяснить молодежи, что ученые обладают суперсилой, которая называется наука. И спрашивали, какая у них суперсила. And once we try to explain to young people that actually scientists, they have a very uh, superpower, and this superpower is a science. И вот uh, сейчас необходимо действительно перевод научных знаний в понятные, интересные формы. And right now we face a situation when we have a lot of scientific data and we need some uh, transfer from this scientific data to something that people can easily understand. Вторая проблема, которая связана с современной наукой, я сейчас говорю о науке в Украине. Talking about second problem that we have in science and right now I speak about science in Ukraine. Это трансформация науки от посттоталитарных практик к демократическим. Uh, this is a problem of transformation of the science uh, from post-totalitaristic form to democratic form. Поскольку утрата результативности науки часто приводила к тому, что пытались сделать научную цензуру и форматировать в какие-то правила. 
because we have some kind of loss of um, results in science and we see that they try to make some censorship uh, in science and this is not very good for science. То есть в результате нужна была уже не истина, а формы, которые связаны с научной ритуализацией. Actually, we have a situation when people do not, uh, people in science do not need the truth, but they need some uh, forms of rituals. В результате ощущения uh, людей, управляющих наукой или регулирующих с помощью государства, было uh, такое постполицейское отношение. And uh, we can say that these people that actually control the science, they have such a feeling that they need some kind of post-police form of it. То есть дисциплинарные практики применялись в науке и создавалась новая барьерная функция. Для докторской диссертации напиши монографию 10 статей. Потом через время монографию отдельно текст 20 статей. Потом дополнительно столько-то статей еще в наукометрических базах. So actually we see right now that there are some kind of disciplinary practices were applied in science. For example, to make a monograph you have to write 10 articles and after you have to make a text and write 20 articles more and after again more articles. То есть создавались дополнительные барьерные функции для того, чтобы отбить желание заниматься реальным интересным делом с названием наука. Actually, what we see, this is some kind of barrier in science uh, when um, young scientists and they do not have a desire to make a science itself because they have so much barriers there. В результате происходила селекция двух видов ученых. Первый вид ученый – это конформисты, которые подстраиваются под какие-то требования. Второй вид ученых, которые борцы и готовы бороться с любыми барьерными функциями. So, and uh, as a result, we have some kind of selection in with scientists. First type of scientists are conformists uh, that are ready to go with such requirements that they have. And another type of scientists, some kind of wrestlers, fighters who are ready to fight for the science and to fight these barriers. И когда появились требования к журналам, связанные со скопусом и Web of Science, это была удобная форма контроля ученых, чтобы они занимались бюрократическими правилами, а не занимались реальными научными результатами. And uh, talking about these requirements, we see that after all of this, we have some um, type of journals like Scopus and Web of Science. And this is actually a very convenient form of control of scientists to make them uh, to be involved in bureaucracy and not to make the science itself and to fight these barriers. Поскольку требования публикации в этих журналах включались в контракт как основной результат, не содержание работ, а именно форма публикации. And actually when we speak about these journals, Web of Science and Scopus, we see that all the requirements of these journals uh, is some kind of contract. So they pay attention too much for the rules of these journals, but not for the content of a scientific work. Но это все не делает настоящего ученого, это создает поле вокруг ученого. But all of this that I have spoken about, this is uh, not, this is, does not make a scientist. This makes some kind of sphere around the scientist, but not the scientist itself. Ученого все-таки создает наука как событие, как чудо, как выход из повседневности. 
talking about what makes a scientist um, this is the science what makes an, a scientist as an event as a, some kind of miracle some kind of thing that pushes one from the ordinary things in, in his life ученого по-прежнему у нас создают научные школы наличие по-настоящему сильного учителя и такого же сильного ученика. What else what makes a scientist? This is um, scientific schools, schools of thought, and very strong teacher who is uh, capable to create his student as a new scientist. И uh, третий немаловажный момент – это все-таки удивление и восторг перед той темой, которой ты занимаешься в науке. And there is also thought, thought about this question. This is some kind of surprise of a person, of a scientist, some kind of delight that he is fascinated of the things that he does. Поэтому наука по-прежнему остается сферой Удивление, как говорил в свое время еще Аристотель, и сферой, которая позволяет выходить из круга повседневности и делать мир лучше. And talking about science, we have to say that this is some kind of sphere of wondering and uh, something, some kind of miracle that pushes one to make something new and get out of the daily life. И здесь еще, конечно, очень важно, как и говорил профессор Джеффри Уэст, это все-таки научное сообщество, та среда, в которой э, возможно обмен интересными идеями и продвижение по этой среде. And also, as my colleague Jeffrey West has said, this is very important to have science community. Uh, this is some kind of sphere when, uh, where people can share their ideas and to go um, up in this some kind of hierarchy. В свое время профессор Минаков привез в Запорожский национальный университет uh, школу молодых ученых где было очень много интересных мастеров и из Франции, и из Америки, и из России, хотя тогда это не очень было принято, и нам пришлось выдержать определенный бой. Спасибо моему коллеге. Но эта форма позволила показать демократическое, демократическую подготовку, когда есть два метра и молодой ученый, который дает свой результат. And also I have to share one story from the past when uh, Professor Minakov made in Ukraine some school of young scientists. He, um, he took his colleagues, masters from France, USA and Russia and uh, took them to Ukraine and they all speak with students and this form allowed to show the democratic preparation of people when there are two Uh, scientists, big scientists, and there is a one student who is ready to become a scientist. И нам частенько приходится сталкиваться с противостоянием так называемых замороженных ученых, профессоров, которые хотят только навязать свои правила с помощью статуса профессора. And also we have some situation when um, we see the confrontation of some kind of, let's say, frozen scientists who uh, try to impose their rules to other young scientists. Мы пытаемся перевести в дискуссию все-таки о содержании, о поиске истины и об открытии. But what we're actually trying to do is to make a discussion, to make the discovery uh, in the science. В результате, вот, например, с профессором Скворцом нам приходилось читать очень большие тексты, которые присылали люди, которые к науке не имеют отношения, но чтобы переключить наше внимание, нам подбрасывали эти тексты не всегда адекватных людей. 
also one story that we have with Professor Skvarets. Very often some people send us uh, some kind of works that are actually are not scientific, but they did it only to switch our attention from our scientific research activity to something else. Поэтому поле науки, это, конечно, я полностью согласен с моим коллегой, это поле результатов, поле открытий и поле научных достижений. А вот в какой форме они будут изложены, это уже все-таки должен быть выбор ученого, который эти открытия сделал. And I have to agree with my colleague that the field of science is a, a field of discovery, a field of something new, a field of achievement. And uh, what the form that it will, it will be uh, created, it is dependent of the scientist who made this um, discovery, who made this achievement. Но эта форма должна быть доступна для научного сообщества. But I have to say that this form of presentation of this discovery has to be uh, very understandable for scientific community. Только с этой позиции получается необходимость журналов и монографий обладает высоким значением. And when we look at the things with this perspective, we see that uh, such journals are very important if they um, if they follow this perspective. Спасибо за внимание. Это те тезисы, которыми я хотел поделиться. Thank you very much for your attention. This is my thesis that I wanted to share with you. Okay. Thank you so much. By this, let me kindly remind you that the extent of your response is like eight minutes. Позвольте напомнить, да, что у нас выступление 8 минут. Okay, and by this moment, let me please give the floor to our colleague, the last but not the least in this round, Владимир Скворец. Please, you're welcome. Уважаемые участники этой интереснейшей дискуссии, тема моего доклада – личность как источник научного творчества. Good evening, dear colleagues, dear uh, participants of this conference. And the theme that I want to talk about is personality as a source of scientific creativity. Хочу отметить актуальность этой научной конференции. And I want to say that uh, this conference is very important right now. Когда я познакомился с темой конференции, я оказался очарован этой темой. And when I ha uh, has, have acquainted it with the topic of this conference, I was very fascinated. Во-первых, исторические это важная отрасль исторической науки, разрабатывать теорию, методику изучения, использования исторических источников. First of all, I would like to say that source studies, it is very important field in science uh, that speak about historical part of science itself. Источники всегда являются основой научного исследования. And talking about sources, this is always, always a basis for any research. Мое понимание источниковедения формировалось во время учебы на историческом факультете Днепропетровского государственного университета 1979-1984 годы. Мое понимание источниковедения формировалось. And talking about um, how I do understand the um, source study, my understanding of it was created when I was a student in University of Dnepropetrovsk in 1979. 1979. Till 1984. And uh, the teacher of source studies was very good historian Nikolai Kowalski который сумел привить интерес к работе с историческими источниками и историографическими материалами. 
and he could actually manage to uh, impose to us uh, the interest to historical sources and to work with historical sources. И третьим обстоятельством является то, что все действительно научные знания всегда создаются исследователями. And also I want to pay your attention that always when we speak about some kind of scientific discoveries, it's always created by researchers. Которые опираются на знания, созданные всеми предшественниками. Uh, these people actually, they... Um, have their own basis which made by all um, people who made some discoveries before them. Вместе с тем встречаются теоретические построения, которые игнорируют исторические источники и не связаны с реальными процессами в жизни общества. Also, when we speak about this issue, we have to understand that we have some kind of theoretical works that are not connected with uh, historical facts and uh, researches. Эти лица являются, занимаются лишь имитацией научной деятельности. This type of people, they actually do some kind of imitation of scientific research. Для получения научного результата важны не просто источники, а познавательная деятельность исследователя, получающего определенные знания. Uh, when we speak about the result that scientists want to have in the end of his work, we have to understand that um, not only sources are important to get this result, but also uh, the work of scientists itself. В осмыслении проблемы научного источника необходимо выходить из понимания роли личности исследователя как важнейшего источника научного, технического и художественного творчества. В осмыслении проблемы научного источника необходимо выходить. Yes, uh, when we speak about uh, source studies itself, in order one has to understand this uh, source, he has to make his own research. Uh, it is very important to understand the personality of this researcher because it is some kind of basis that creates his uh, result in his research activity. На моем жизненном пути мне выпала честь общаться и попасть под влияние таких личностей. Talking about uh, my life, uh, I had the honor to meet very, um, very remarkable personalities in my life. Such Среди as... них были Николай Павлович Ковальский и Виталий Иванович Воловик. Николай Ковальский и Виталий Воловик. О личности Николая Павловича Ковальского как источнике научного творчества. And talking about uh, Professor Kowalski as a source of uh, some kind of folklore creativity. Николай Ковальский, доктор исторических наук, профессор, заведующий кафедрой источниковедения и историографии. 27 лет работал в Днепропетровском государственном университете. Professor Kowalski is a doctor of historical scientists and he was a professor in Dnepropetrovsk University for many, many years. С его именем связано создание и функционирование Днепропетровской школы источниковедения. And actually when we speak about Professor Kowalski, we speak about the creation of certain school of source studies in this university которая была хорошо известна среди ученых не только в Украине и Советском Союзе, но и за их пределами в Польше, Германии, США, Канаде. And this school was actually very famous not only in Ukraine and in Soviet Union, but also in Poland, in Germany, in USA and Canada. На этой кафедре защитили диссертации на соискание ученой степени доктора исторических наук 
такие на соискание ученой степени доктора исторических наук такие авторитетные ученые. And also Professor Kowalski met a chair where very famous um, researchers uh, made their PhD. Как Ирина Ковалева, Александр Болебрух, Ирина Колесник. Uh, this uh, scientists like Ирина Ковалева, Александр Болебрух, Анатолий Ирина... Болебрух, Ирина Колесник. Ирина Колесник. Сергей Плохий. Сергей Плохих. Виталий Подгоецкий. Виталий Подгоецкий. Юрий Мыцик. Юрий Мыцик. Анна Швидко. Анна Швидко. Александр Удот. And другие. Александр Удот and many others. These are all scientists that made their PhD in this university. Когда Украина стала независимым государством, Николай Ковальский, который был родом из Острога, стал одним из инициаторов возрождения старейшего высшего учебного заведения Украины, Острожской академии. Uh, when Ukraine became an independent state, um, Николай Ковальский, who was actually from uh, a city named Ostrog, he became one of the initiators of the revival of the oldest higher educational institution in Ukraine. I'm, I'm sorry, dear colleagues, I just hate doing this and hate interrupting. Я прошу прощения, что должна прерваться. У нас лимит времени. Пожалуйста, одна минута, чтобы сделать вывод. One minute for conclusions, please. Ну, я не успел сказать о своем наставнике Виталии Ивановиче, Волоке, который создал тоже научную школу. Восемь докторов наук и девять докторов наук и девять кандидатов наук создал. Uh, and I also wanted to share about my teacher Vitaly Volovic, who also created a scientific school, who made eight uh, doctors of scientists and nine candidate, candidates of scientists. Ну и в конце что создает ученого? And also in the end of my speech, I want to share my opinion what makes a scientist. Характеристика личности Николая Ковальского Виталия Воловика. Uh, actually, the characteristic of personality of Vitaly Volovic and Nikolai Kovalsky. Их трудовой научной и общественной деятельности. Uh, their uh, labor activity and um, society activity. Social activity. И общественной деятельности дает основания для выводов, трудовой научной и общественной деятельности дает основания для выводов о том, какие факторы создают ученого. All their activity gives a basis for conclusions which factors actually makes a scientist. Во-первых, результаты научной творческой деятельности ученого. First of all, we speak about results of the scientific activity of the scientist. Которые зафиксированы в его монографиях, научных статьях и других публикациях. Uh, which actually were published in monographs, in his monographs, his articles and other works. Которые содержат разработанные им идеи, концепции, теории. Which actually includes uh, cons concepts, ideas of them. Во вторых, его личный вклад в подготовку ученых. The second factor is the is his contribution to preparation of new young scientists. Которые являются специалистами на высшей квалификации. Which are actually a very high specialists. В-третьих, наивысшим показателем творческих достижений ученого является создание им собственной научной школы, о чем говорил Максим Анатольевич Лепский. And the third factor that is very important when we speak about what creates a scientist, uh, this is the creation of a scientific school. В-четвертых, высокая результативность в решении практических проблем жизни общества. And the fourth factor is... Uh, Высокая результативность. 
yes, it's very uh, many results and actually when, yes, uh, when a person is ready to, res uh, to resolve many problems of the society's life. Последнее, пятое, я заканчиваю. Пятых, последнее. Реальное влияние ученого. The real influence of scientist. На формирование мировоззрения и отношения к жизни. For formation of world view and the influence of the life. Своих учеников, студентов, аспирантов и докторантов. To his students, aspirants, candidates and other students. И последнее. Значение каждого ученого определяет, определяется его отношением к науке и местом, которое занимает его творчество в науке. And the value of every scientist... Um is determined by his attitude to science and which place uh, he is uh, contained in the science. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you very much for your attention. Again, thank you so much for your speech. So it was longer than eight, eight minutes. So again, next time I'm going to interrupt if it's going to be more than eight minutes. Итак, в следующий раз, если речь будет и длиться доли восьми минут, я буду вас прерывать. Таков регламент. Okay, by this, let's switch to the second round of our discussion panel, right? And the, que the next question is, how to differentiate a real scientific resource from the fake? Very interesting and peculiar question. So this is the problem of the understandability of scientific work. And uh, one more thing, a large number of works are not intelligible for the general public. Who were they written to? So these are the things we're going to discuss right now. And by this moment, please let me give the floor to Dr. Oleg Maltsev. Welcome. Спасибо, что дали слово. Thank you for giving me the floor. Пока мы разбирали с вами первый вопрос, я был очень впечатлен мнениями коллег о том, как оценивают ученые, кто же такой все-таки ученый, как его воспринимает общество. While we were tackling together the first question, I was very impressed by the answers of my colleagues as to who is a scientist and how he is evaluated or assessed. И вот меня всегда очень удивляло э, это поиск финансирования. Вот слово вот это поиск финансирования для ученого. And what always surprised me is a word as searching for funding. Да. This was very interesting for me. С моей точки зрения это ужасное безобразие. In my viewpoint, this is an unacceptable state of affairs. Да, потому что вот меня, например, мои учителя как бы учили по-другому. For instance, my teachers taught me differently. Меня не учили так, что если я ученый, то я могу применить науку и создать любые финансы для того, чтобы финансировать свои исследования. My mentor and my teachers taught me in the following way. If you are a scientist, that means that by applying that science, you should be capable of providing and creating conditions for conducting your research. И мне кажется, вот это потребительское отношение некоторых ученых к тому, что им что-то должно дать, крайне их как ученых дискредитирует. Ну, потому что, когда люди смотрят на человека, который себя называют ученым, то есть они его воспринимают, как Максим Анатольевич Лепский сказал, как волшебника. Because when people uh, say scientist or a scholar, as Professor Maxim Lepsky noted, uh, majority of the public perceives uh, him almost like a magician, in quotation marks. И uh, они думают, как же этот волшебник не может со сотворить волшебство и превратить свои знания в некие финансовые средства, которые могли бы профинансировать его исследования. Что же это за ученый такой? Figuratively speaking, what kind of magician or a scientist is that who is not capable of uh, uh, applying his research and providing for uh, conducting his own research? 
Если в руках человека сила науки, то я думаю, что проблем с финансированием не должно быть вообще. Этот вопрос не должен подниматься. If one has a power of science in his hands, then the question of funding should be irrelevant. It should not even arise. И вы знаете, я достаточно долго уже смотрю вот на особенно украинскую академическую науку и всегда удивляюсь, насколько эти люди отличаются вот в двух ипостасях. So uh, I've been uh, observing Ukrainian um, scientific community particularly, and it's uh, uh, I've been noting the two states of uh, academia in Ukraine. Да, и вот какие они в университете, да? The first one is the way scientific community behaves at the university. Да, и какие они на международной конференции, когда в линейке такая ну, гамма грандов, которые их слушают. And another behavior that we see is uh, on the international conferences when there are different grants that uh, different Uh, great scientists that are listening to them. А так как я ну, достаточно часто участвую в конференциях и за границей, и uh, uh, езжу в экспедиционные как бы, поездки с исследовательской целью, я часто встречаюсь с разными учеными в разных точках мира. And due to uh, the opportunity of uh, participating in different international conferences and conducting expeditionary research activities in different countries, I have the opportunity to see different people and different scientists. И uh, вот я здесь очень много услышал о том, чем же все-таки занимается наука. And I have heard a lot uh, from my colleagues is what does the scientist or what is the scientific pursuit? И я не совсем согласен с некоторыми коллегами, которые тут высказались по поводу того, чем она все-таки должна заниматься. And I do not agree uh, on all points with my colleagues as to what is scientific pursuit and what a scientist should do. То есть, если мы все поделим на поле известного и поле неизвестного, if we are going to divide everything to two zones. First is the zone of unknown and zone of known. То, безусловно, внимание ученых должно быть сосредоточено в поле неизвестного, да? Then logically, the attention of scientists and scholars should be on the zones that are unknown. У нас очень многие люди почему-то сегодня путают преподавателя и ученого. Это разные вещи. For some reason, in the modern world, uh, people substitute or um, do not distinguish clearly an educator and a scholar. То есть очень многие люди почему-то считают, что если человек преподает в университете, значит, он ученый. Because uh, if a person is somebody who teaches at the university, it doesn't necessarily make him a scientist. Это совершенно не так. That is not the case. То есть вы можете на него хоть 200 званий навесить, хоть докторов, хоть профессоров, 50 раз профессор, 40 раз доктор, он ученым как не был, так никогда в жизни не станет. One might be a, a professor, one might have a lot of degrees, a lot of awards, but... Uh, It doesn't necessarily make him a scientist. По причине того, что ученый это человек, который разрешает поле неизвестного. С одной стороны. Because a true scientist is in the first place, he is somebody who explores the zones of unknown. Это эта работа как раз и ну как бы заканчивается научным открытием. And this exploration of unknown zones is something that leads to finishing a certain research work. И смотрит для того, чтобы зона известного не искажалась со временем под воздействием политических и прочих установок. From the other side, the scientist is somebody who has to closely take care and look that zones of knowns are not distorted under the influence of different factors such as politics, cultural and historical and time tenets. Так вот, сегодня появилось огромное количество работ, э, вроде как научных, но на самом деле это фейки. 
So um, the thing is that in today's world, we see a lot of works that pretend to be a scientific work, but in fact, this is just a fake. Да, и меня все время спрашивают, говорят, Олег, чем научная работа отличается от ненаучной работы? And the frequent question that I receive is that what is the difference between real scientific work and just a fake one? Я попытаюсь сейчас объяснить, как в свое время выдающиеся ученые, как бы мои учителя, учили меня, чем отличается научная работа от ненаучной и почему так. So now I would like to briefly explain the criteria of what is real scientific work, academic work, the way it was taught by my teachers, outstanding scientists of their time. Я когда начинаю какую-то научную работу, мне нужно определиться с патронажем, the то first... есть с вертикальным контролем. The first step, whenever I start a certain research scientific work, the first thing that I do, I have to determine the patronage, a vertical control system of the work. Да, то есть я понимаю прекрасно, что в момент научного исследования, как пока я его провожу, я как ученый могу, ну, как бы ошибаться, у меня может как бы сложиться неверное впечатление, поэтому я всегда выбираю вертикальный контроль кого-то из своих коллег, которые ну, с которым я могу обсуждать свою текущую работу, вот, например, Максим Анатольевич Лепский, с которым я могу обсуждать свою текущую работу для того, чтобы у меня, ну, как бы, одно мое мнение, как бы, не портило ход научного, как бы, исследования. То есть дискуссия уже возникает в ходе самой, как бы, научной работы, в ходе исследования. And the reason the patronage thing is very important, uh, the fact that I choose a colleague uh, who would be um, following my work is because every scientist, every person can make a mistake. So this is an important part so that somebody checks and controls and reviews my work from the outside objectively. And after that, uh, in the course of the research work, we get to the stage of the discussion between two scholars. Да, и очень многие люди считают, что если Максим Анатольевич, как бы он со мной там в каких-то хороших отношениях, у нас не бывает жарких дискуссий, как бы на эту тему, это неправда совершенно, мы он в экспедициях там до двух часов ночи, как бы да, поэтому это, это совсем не так. And for instance, in certain research projects, professor Maxim Anatoly Lepsky is uh, the person that reviews my work, and some people might think that because we are friends, he might... Uh, uh, I mean, he might behave as a friend. That is not the case. He 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 he's an opponent uh, to me, and in our expeditionary rates, sometimes our discussions go up to two a.m. Как Максим Анатольевич говорит, вы мне друзья, но истина дороже. Профессор Лепский, uh, he has a saying: "You are my friend, but the truth costs more. It's more valuable." Да. Второе. Я когда книгу открываю какую-то и не вижу понятной методологии, она должна быть в самом начале. Как бы, я понимаю, что это недоучная работа. Как бы, да. The second requirement for a scientific work is to have a scientific methodology, which is clear and understandable. То есть люди должны понимать, что вы использовали для того, чтобы получить результаты. Because people who are reading your work, they should understand what kind of methodology, what did you use in order to obtain those results. Третье – это научная логика изложения. Third requirement for a work to be scientific, it should be, uh, it should follow a certain logic of narration or description. То есть последовательность должна соответствовать научной логике изложения. The sequence uh, uh, of things that are narrated, that are depicted in the research, they should uh, be uh, in conformity with the scientific logic. Да. Безусловно, подобного рода работа должна быть подвергнута научному редактированию. And certainly a work as such should be, uh, should go through scientific editorial work. Для этого у нас и существует ну, вертикальный патронат. And that, that is why we have the vertical patronage. После этого uh, должна быть получена обратная связь от академического сообщества то есть должны быть рецензенты ну, на эту работу, прежде чем вы ее публиковать собираетесь, как бы. And the fifth step for a work to be like real academic work is to receive a feedback from academic community, basically the reviews before the publication of the work. Да, потому что рецензент это подготовка к дискуссии относительно этой работы в обществе. 
because when we are speaking about this stage, it is a preparation for the discussion of this work. То есть это в интересах ученого подготовиться к дискуссии заранее до того, как ее начнут критиковать вашу работу. And certainly in the first place, it should be of interest of a scientist himself because he has to prepare for the discussion before somebody starts criticizing his work. Да, и в результате должен получиться научный продукт. Я не знаю, в каком виде он у кого как бы ну, получается, но с моей точки зрения идеальным инструментом работы ученого является монография. And as a result of all the stages, one uh, should end up with a certain scientific final product. And I believe that different scientists have their own idea of how this product should look like. But in my opinion, a monograph is the best product that would uh, demonstrate um, what scientists work. Потому что как бы статья, она как бы позволяет только ну, обратить внимание на какую-то проблему, но раскрыть ее не позволяет. Here's the reason why I say monograph. Because when we speak about the article, it is something that grabs your attention to the problematic, but it doesn't allow you to fully express the scientific dilemma. То есть, по сути своей, монография – это идеальный инструмент как бы для ученого. А статья – это вспомогательный инструмент как бы для ученого. To put it simply, a monograph is a perfect tool for a scientist, and an article, a research article, is an auxiliary tool. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Maestro, for your speech. By this moment, please let me give the floor to our next speaker, Dr. Atina Karatsugiani. Please, you're welcome. Sorry, I think um, I think uh, uh, that I was not prepared to speak uh, right now, but uh, uh, I think that. What for me, uh, from what I, I'm hearing, uh, uh, I really liked uh, the you are my friend, but truth is a better friend, right? And uh, I think uh, sometimes what is difficult is to understand how the perhaps the interpersonal relationships influence the kind of collaborations also we do. I thought that was a, a, a wonderful um, point. Uh, but uh, other than that, in the question uh, that we're, that we're discussing. Um, I think sort of relying uh, that we have to agree that uh, we rely on something that has been uh, triangulated, right? In some form of way that uh, has been meson triangulated in some form of way that is uh, factual in some way. Now, what has happened, unfortunately, uh, particularly in the last five years, is that uh, we are in um, some kind of environment that is heavily, um, heavily structured by uh, disinformation architectures, right? And this, in some ways, uh, infiltrates also the fields of science. I mean, recently we have been going through a pandemic, and you can see that in different countries. Uh, you have um, hundreds and thousands of, of people creating groups that are uh, supporting uh, QAnon or um, conspiracy theories or, uh, uh, you know, climate change deniers, all sorts of people like infiltrating yoga groups and uh, information aids, um, kind of uh, eco-fascist kind of scenarios. And you start to think about, well, what is it that this make, makes these people so susceptible to, to be you know, in this kind of activity? Like, what, what is it, what, why does this happen? I mean, where has been the failure there in the education system or whatever? But I think the failure for me, like the way I look at some of this is how the environment, in, environment itself actually works. Right. So when you have an environment, uh, for example, on um, um, social media networks, Facebook, Twitter and so on, that uh, uh, works with the logic that the more controversial the stuff, the more, you know, like uh, ads are going to be sold, the more, uh, you know, there's the business model of, of that kind of way where you have this disinformation that is part of the, the business model of the story. They have these viral articles, clickbaits and so on happening. So, so you have like that sort of uh, media environment that is 
uh, has these problems. And I think this has been a problem also for science in a way, because we are called to share, you know, like the impact of our work on these networks as well. Right. Um, the other issue has to do, I think, with the, the political culture within which um, scientific work has to be carried out. Uh, and sometimes uh, the problem with the political culture is there are countries where or science has to be toying a certain line, right? In, uh, in the past, uh, uh, colleagues have mentioned uh, a more sort of uh, uh, totalitarian kind of way where science was serving the regime. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible to do science. So, or for, for, for that matter, it wouldn't be possible to publish novels or to, to do art or you do music, right? So you have uh, sort of this kind of uh, problems that are relevant as well. Um, finally, I think the biggest issue for me and how uh, this plays out is the economics, the economics, um, the economic systems with which uh, we have to, to kind of deal with when we do science, right? And, and, and I already mentioned uh, that for me, when you don't have uh, the, the, let's say the luxury that uh, uh, even uh, the colleagues in the totalitarianism used to have <laughs> of having the time, right, to do, uh, to do your work because you're pacing yourself in the McDonald's, right? When you are in the McDonald's and you try to do your science or your scholarship, you will never produce, right? Anything that is uh, as, uh, uh, as exquisite or, or intellectually, um, intellectually developing, advancing, right? Uh, scholarship. And, uh, and this, I think, uh, is the, the key thing for me, is how the economics of the situation uh, works. That is important as well. Um, so yes, thank you. This is what I wanted to say on this section. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the next speaker will be Professor Maxim Lepsky. Please unmute yourself. Мы вас не слышим. Так, я включил звук. Спасибо, что предоставили слово. У нас действительно было очень много интересных дискуссий с моим другом и коллегой Олегом Викторовичем, особенно во время экспедиции. Thank you very much for giving me the floor, and I want to say that we had very interesting discussions with my friend and colleague Dr. Maltsov during our expeditions. Но вот Профессор Скворец не даст мне сказать неточность. Я всегда приезжал с массой открытий, массой интересных идей и совершенно другой динамикой. And also, um, my colleague, Professor Skvarets, uh, will tell that actually it is true that every time when I came back from the expedition, I had many discoveries and many materials, facts and something that I can to share. И вот э, позиция, что исследование, с одной стороны, это очень четкая методология и выстроенная методика. And there is some kind of position in uh, source studies that all research, this is a clear methodology and a certain methodic. Но с другой стороны, это очень интересная дискуссия и открытие во время исследования. But from the other hand, this is uh, some kind of discussion also uh, during uh, of making discovery. Вот это как раз и создает настоящее поле исследований, настоящую науку. This is what actually creates the real field of uh, research, the real science. Конечно, безусловно, мы стараемся очень внимательно относиться к моментам логической выстроенности, начиная от понятийного, интерпретационного, операционального, индикаторного анализа тех исследований, которые мы делаем. And of course, I have to speak about that we try to be very attentive to the different type of anal analysis when we speak about logical, oper operational, and indicator types of analysis. 
Но одновременно мы часто в социологии сталкиваемся с тем, что операторы, по которым мы замеряем, могут меняться. But also I have to say that uh, in science we very often come across with the fact that operators uh, which help us to make some kind of analysis, they are very changeable. Например, каждый социолог знает, что в социологическом исследовании, я сейчас говорю о количественных, нужна паспортичка, где демография, профессия, возраст и так далее. And also when we speak about sociology, every sociologist knows uh, when it comes to the uh, quantitative research, uh, we need some kind of paspartishka, which, which uh, contains the age of people who were interviewed and some kind of information about them. И достаточно не провести перепись населения за 20 лет и выборка исследований по стране может обладать существенной погрешностью. And this is enough not to make some kind of population census for 20 years in the country. And we already see that the sampling in this country it has uh, many errors and mistakes. Но всегда самое интересное исследование – это, конечно, качественное исследование. But every time when we speak about researches, we have to say that the most interesting researches uh, it is about the quality of researches. When we speak about quality of researches. Конечно, в классической академической науке не всегда uh, возможно обеспечить финансирование, и об этом абсолютно правильно сказал мой коллега и друг Олег Викторович. And I also have to pay your attention to the fact that when we speak about classical academic science, this is uh, not often possible to uh, make financing, um, financing of these uh, researches, uh, as my colleague Dr. Maltsev already have said. Но эти системы очень неплохо мы видели продуманные в Европе, в Германии, в старых известных университетах. But actually, talking about finance, uh, finances, we have to say that there are many systems in Europe that are not badly thought out, that um, works very good when we speak about universities in Germany and some other universities of Europe. Поэтому вопрос о настоящих научных исследованиях, конечно, обладает целым большим спектром проблематики. От качества внутреннего исследования до финансирования и задач, которые стоят перед этим исследованием. Um... But actually, when we speak about issue, about uh, real researches, we see that it has the whole spectrum of problems, which starts from the quality of internal researches, and it ends with uh, financing and the goals of these researches. И не менее важным, конечно, является проблема научного языка. And also we have to pay attention that there is a problem of a scientific language. Потому что это очень напоминает средневековье, когда латынь знала не так много людей, и научным языком была исключительно латынь. Мы как-то обсуждали с Ириной Игоревной вопрос о том, что часть наших ученых очень любит англоязычные заимствованные слова, которые только своим звучанием производят неизгладимый эффект на аудиторию, но содержания под этим ничего нет. 
And uh, I was spoke with my colleague Irina Igorovna Lopatyuk that all scientists right now they love uh, English words, they love words that come from another languages. But actually, when we speak about these words, maybe they can uh, make some impression of um, to our audience. But at the same time, there is no content in these words. Поэтому иногда Форма значительно важнее содержания, но это к науке не имеет отношения. That's why we can say that sometimes the form is more important than content, but this, is, uh, the, this has nothing to do with the science. Поэтому я согласен с моими коллегами, которые высказали идею о том, что все-таки призвание науки значительно более важное. И ценность истины значительно более существенна, чем просто промоушен ученого. That's why I want to say that I agree with my colleagues that the idea that the vocation of science is more important, the value is more important than the promotion of the certain scientist. Но в конечном счете все проверяется по гамбургскому счету. But, but in the end, we have to understand that everything will be verified with Hamburg account. Это старая история, когда в Гамбурге было кафе, где собирались борцы, бойцы и так далее. И вне зависимости от того, сколько у тебя званий, наград и титулов, вот есть татами, пожалуйста, покажи, чего ты стоишь. Или если в науке монографии и открытие на стол. And this is very old story about uh, city of Hamburg. There was some kind of cafe where many fighters were located every evening and uh, it wasn't dependent how many titles or awards every fighter has because they had a tatami so if you are ready please show what you can do and talking about science uh, we can make uh, some parallel picture of it so if you are a scientist please show your works your monographs and papers спасибо за внимание thank you very much for your attention thank you for your speech professor lipsky and by this please let me give the floor to vladimir skvarets мы вас не слышим Включаю. Уважаемые участники этой интереснейшей дискуссии, хочу высказать и свое мнение о том, как ну, отличить действительно ученого от того, кто лжеученый, имитирует научную деятельность. Dear participants, uh, действительно... thank you very much for this discussion. This is very interesting and I want to share my opinion what actually uh, differentiate the real uh, scientist from the fake scientist. Действительно, вот поставлен вопрос о понятности результатов научной деятельности. Но здесь проблема связана с типами личности. Ведь ученые – это, как правило, ну, ученые – это личность, которая себя реализует в науке. А обыватель – представитель массовой культуры. And, of course, we have to pay attention to the understandability of the results of scientific research. And this is very important to speak about the type of personality, the personality type. And the scientist, first of all, is a certain personality that has his own uh, research activity. Ведь представители науки они действительно составляют сообщество определенное, которое общается на научном языке, которое представляет, у каждого из них могут быть разработаны концепции, свои научные представления, и э, общаются на, вот сегодня говорили об этом, э, методом дискуссии. 
And of course, uh, when we speak about representatives of science, uh, this is a certain community. And these are people who communicate uh, with the help of scientific language. Uh, they have their own concepts uh, that they can share. And they communicate by the method of discussion that my colleagues, colleagues have said. Научные дискуссии, в отличие от тех телешоу, которые мы наблюдаем, они действительно по своему содержанию э, и на научном языке, понятном для э, ученых, они ведутся, э, в них представлены научные формы, то есть идеи, э, решение проблем, постановка решения проблем, гипотезы, концепции, теории. То есть то, что непонятно для обывателя. And when we speak about scientific discussion, um, as opposed to it's some kind of discussion of the TV shows, uh, these discussions are very meaningful. They are understandable to every scientist. They have scientific language and uh, it has scientific forms. It has a problem statement, solutions, concepts, ideas, and everything that um, we can resolve. Uh, to these problems that made uh, by this scientific research. Более того, эти дискуссии нацелены на э, поиск истины и приближение к практическому решению проблем природы, общества, человека. And of course, we have to understand that these discussions are aimed uh, to find the truth and to become, to get in closer to a practical solution about society, about uh, community, about nature and about human. Ну вот поэтому получается, что научная проблематика, она не всегда доступна для обывателя, не всегда ее удается представить в, на, в научно-популярной форме. And that's why we have to pay your attention that scientific issues are not always available to the layman, to the person who has nothing to do with the science. Я обращаю внимание на то, что когда смотришь работы научные и видишь, действительно работа научная или не научная, то в научной работе всегда видны, например, Неизбежно присутствуют исторические методы исследования. And when we talk about uh, scientific works, when you see, when you look at these scientific works, you see a certain factors that uh, actually makes this work a scientific. And there, first of all, there is a historical method. Логический метод, без которого просто невозможно выделение концепта, построение концепций, теорий и, и э, соотношение с этим, с этим, ну фактически теоретический дискурс, соотношение с другими э, учеными, э, дискуссия. And along with the historical method, there is also a logical method, uh, without which it is not possible to make concepts, theories, and to some kind of relationship to discourse. И поэтому я хочу обратить внимание, что научное сообщество фактически со времен средневековья и до наших дней стремилось оградить себя как профессиональное сообщество от случайных людей и выработала для этого определенные методы и способы. And I also want to pay your attention that the scientific community since the Middle Ages uh, decided to protect itself from, from random people by um, scientific language and other methods. Одним из таких способов <laughs> была э, установлена защита диссертаций. And one of these methods is actually uh, when you have to protect your uh, work, your dissertation. Эта традиция пришла из средневековья, когда в городах образовались профессиональные сообщества, там союзы купцов, это цехи, союзы 
вернее, союзы ремесленников, цехи, союзы купцов, гильдии, ну и союзы преподавателей студентов, это университеты. And also, uh, actually talking about this, uh, this tradition came from the Middle Ages too, uh, when uh, there were created professional societies, some kind of uh, merchants, craftsmen, and when we speak about teachers and students, uh, it was the organization of university. Подобно тому, как подмастерье для того, чтобы стать мастером, должен был изготовить шедевр, образец ремесленного изделия, и защитить его перед э, э, цехом ремесленников. And uh, we can make some kind of parallel when we speak about uh, the assistant of master uh, who had to make some kind of masterpiece to, uh, to prove that he is ready to become a master. Соискатель ученой степени должен был представить свой научный шедевр и защитить его перед судом профессоров. So uh, there is another parallel. So the degree seeker had to protect his work uh, in front of different professors in order to uh, prove that he is ready to become a scientist. Таким образом, защита диссертации перед ученым советом – это прекрасная традиция, пришедшая к нам из эпохи Средневековья. So, right now I have to say that defense of dissertations, this is a beautiful tradition that came to us from the Middle Ages. Но по существу являющейся формой самоорганизации профессиональных сообществ. But at the same time we have to understand that it is uh, of some kind of self-organization of communities. Способная поддерживать высокий уровень профессионализма его членов. Uh, which is um, which is able to support the professionalism of their members и нацеливающая на пополнение новыми профессионалами и нацеливающая извиняюсь на пополнение новыми профессионалами and also it has a certain goal to make replenishment of new professionals которые не только отвечают уже достигнутому уровню требований сообщества, но и стимулирующие к тому, чтобы его превзойти. So all these people, they not already have become uh, so, um, had become a masters who has a level of requirements, but also they are ready to become even more and to be higher of this level of requirements. Без опоры на серьезные источники и обоснование определенной новизны соискатель просто не мог получить признание научного сообщества. Uh, without the basis on serious sources, uh, this person who decided to become a member of scientific sources, uh, circles, he could not become this member. Поэтому я считаю, что и современное и современное сообщество ученых тоже заинтересовано и в сохранении этой традиции, и как формы самоорганизации профессионалов, и формы защиты от случайных людей, от проходимцев. And that's why I personally think that the modern scientific community is interested uh, in preserving this tradition as a form of self-organization from the one hand and from the another hand is kind of protection from random people. Благодарю вас за внимание. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. So by this moment, please let me give the floor just uh, several reference points by Dr. Lev Malsov. We just don't hear you. Меня слышно? Да, маленькая реплика относительно предыдущего доклада. I would like to make uh, several comments regarding the previous uh, speech. То есть, если мы говорим об ученом, то мы как бы не можем говорить о диссертации ни при каких обстоятельствах. 
So these are comments to previous speaker's speech. Uh, so when we're speaking about a scientist, we cannot limit and speak about dissertations. And this is uh, something, this is a misconception if one considers scientists and evaluates him according to the dissertation. Дело в том, что если мы возьмем закон Украины о научно-технической деятельности, for instance, if we take a law of Ukraine about scientific and uh, technological activity, то там определение ученого совершенно четко дано. Then in the uh, jurisprudence you would see a definition of a scientist. То есть человек, который критическое количество времени занят научной деятельностью. And the definition in simple words it's about a scientist is a person that dedicates a critical amount of time to a scientific activity. То есть, там ни про какую диссертацию ничего не сказано. In other words, there is nothing said about dissertation. Uh, диссертация – это личная воля изъявления человека, совершенно не обязательно для ученого. Dissertation is something which is done uh, not compulsory, it's uh, his choice to conduct that kind of work and to have that dissertation, but it is not compulsory for a scientist to have it. То есть все регалии ученого, там, звания и так далее, это все прилагательное к его научной работе, но никак не обязательное. So my point is that the rewards, the statuses that are given to a scholar is something auxiliary. This is not something obligatory. Да, поэтому, когда мы говорим о том, ну, кто такой ученый, это не обязательно человек, у которого есть докторская диссертация или там какая-то другая диссертация. Therefore, when we are speaking about a scientist, it is not necessarily a person who would have a doctorate thesis or some kind of other thesis. То есть я знаю огромное количество выдающихся ученых, у которых нет никаких диссертационных работ. I know a huge number of extraordinary, outstanding scholars that do not have any dissertation works. И самое главное, что мы не можем человеку указать, когда ему защищать диссертацию. And what's even more important is that you can never tell or you can never oblige somebody to conduct a dissertation work at a certain point uh, in the given time. То есть наукой он начал заниматься в 20 лет, а диссертацию в 50 защитил. Что же он 30 лет не занимался наукой? Let us uh, think of an example. Let's say one scholar, he started doing science when he was 20 years old and he defended his thesis when he's 50. So does it turn out that whole 30 years he was not doing science? No, it doesn't. То есть, по сути своей, он все эти 30 лет был ученым, просто диссертацию решил защищать в 50 лет. In a nutshell, all this time, all this period, he was a scientist. It's just he decided to defend his thesis dissertation when he was 50 years old. И вот, например, как мои учителя когда-то в свое время говорили, что диссертация, она дает только одно – возможность работать в государственных программах. And as my mentor and teachers told me, the dissertation is something that gives an opportunity for a scholar to work on in governmental structures. Ничего большего диссертация не дает. Nothing more uh, you can obtain from thesis in simple words. Да, поэтому uh, мы должны как бы, во-первых, придерживаться нормы закона, как бы Украины. That's in the first uh, place we should uh, abide and uh, operate in the frameworks of the Ukrainian law. Потому что вот подобного рода заявления на научной конференции них очень опасные. В связи с тем, что потом их неверно интерпретируют, как бы определенного рода реакционные круги. I should note that this type of statements that were done by our dear previous colleague are quite dangerous to be outspoken in the conferences as such, for the simple reason that in the long run, certain reactionary groups might misinterpret, misinterpret your words. Я поэтому и попросил слово, потому что я еще раз повторяю, что на такой солидной конференции, когда звучат такие ну вот вещи, которые противоречат закону Украины о научно-технической деятельности, потом э, находятся журналисты, которые вот э, эти вещи интерпретируют против ученых. So this is the reason I've asked, I can't ask to provide me several minutes uh, to speak, is because when on the, on the conferences of such level, when things are stated that contradict the Ukrainian law, might be used against the scientists in the long run, by specific journalists. 
Да, и именно поэтому я и попросил слово для того, чтобы внести некие как бы коррективы. Я ни в коем случае как бы не претендую на истину в последней инстанции, но все-таки хотел бы обратить внимание на закон о научно-технической деятельности в Украине. So the whole purpose of me taking uh, up the floor is to grab your and turn your attention to the law of Ukraine. Uh, I do not uh, uh, say that things that I'm I'm telling are hundred percent truth. Is just please turn your attention to that. Да, чтобы слова моего коллеги были ни в коем случае впоследствии никем неверно не интерпретированы. I I I just do not want that the words of my colleagues are misinterpreted by somebody. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Dr. Malsev. Позвольте небольшую реплику. Are we going to follow the discussion? У нас будет дискуссия. Давайте. Ну, если мы говорим о законе Украины научно-технической деятельности, о вообще о научно-технической политике в Украине, то можно посмотреть цифры, статистику, которая действительно является ну, научным источником, фактом, сколько было ученых в 1990 году? 290 тысяч. И э, в 2010 году 89 тысяч осталось. В три раза меньше. То тогда можно говорить о том, как наше государство, как его законы охраня... обеспечивают научную деятельность статус ученого, вот те научно-технические, научно-исследовательские институты, которые были за это время ликвидированы. Ну, это связано и с процессом деиндустриализации, и с утечкой мозгов в другие страны и так далее. Поэтому тут, знаете, ну, не так все просто. Это действительно вопросы, то, о чем говорил Олег Викторович. Есть такая позиция, но это вопросы дискуссионные когда речь идет о сохранении и развитии нашей науки. Спасибо. Я полностью согласен с коллегой. Абсолютно. Но закон есть закон. Okay, спасибо за дискуссию. Thank you for your discussion. And by this moment, please let me give the floor to our final speaker, who is the journalist and the editor-in-chief of the Granite of Science, Scientific and Popular Journal. So, Daria Tarusova, you're welcome, please. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, dear scholars. I'm really honored to take part in this uh, conference. Uh, I want to mention that we are conducting this broadcast worldwide on our Facebook page. And uh, I'm going to conduct my speech in Russian because I want our subscribers, uh, who are mostly Russian speakers, uh, by now to understand it straightly. Uh, thank you, Maria or Irina, for translation in advance. Меня зовут Дарья Тарусова, я главный редактор научно-популярного журнала «Гранит науки», и он зарегистрирован в Европе, в Латвии конкретно. По сути, если, для стран, если не для стран бывшего СНГ, то точно для Украины этот журнал является, можно сказать, единственным в своем сегменте. То есть у него нет сколько-нибудь серьезных альтернатив именно в сегменте научно-популярных изданий. И вот я с вами хочу поделиться, поскольку конференция источниковеческая, таким совершенно новым, для нас неизвестным и крайне опасным механизмом, с которым нам пришлось столкнуться. Сейчас вы все поймете. Я хочу для начала сказать, что напомнить вам, что к середине 2020 года аудитория Фейсбука, то есть в Фейсбуке зарегистрировано уже порядка... 2,8 миллиардов человек. Аудитория нашей Facebook-страницы составляет 60 тысяч человек на данный момент. И вот она динамично росла, 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 пока по какой-то странной причине вдруг, как будто просто кто-то перекрыл кран, стало становиться меньше лайков и комментариев. If I need to stop for translation. Uh, 
Okay, let me start. So, by this moment, speaking, uh, the speaker is Daria Tarusova, who is the editor in chief of the Grant of Science Scientific and Popular. Uh, edition and journal. And uh, first of all, she is glad to greet all the speakers right now. And uh, secondly, this is actually the moment the journalist would like to share her perspectives and findings concerning very dangerous mechanisms that we are seeing right now in the social network area, especially in, on Facebook. So, as far as many of you are concerned, actually, this, uh, this conference is right now being broadcasted on the official page on Facebook, the Grant of Science page. Mm -hmm. So, these are our media partners, by the way. And uh, we should say that Grant of Science is a unique journal because it has no any other alternatives in Ukraine. And there is one more option. Uh, the Grant of Science was registered not in Ukraine, but uh, in uh, European Union. And right now, as far as the, this dangerous social network mechanism is concerned, we should be emphatic about a very specific tendency. So the tendency is as follows. Um, overall, there are like 20, uh, 280 million people registered in Facebook. This is uh, number one. Number two, there are 60, uh, 100 subscribers on Grant of Science Facebook page. 60. I believe, right? So the tendency is okay. as follows. The tendency is as follows. The granite of science, as, as many other Facebook pages, was uh, developing uh, like stage by stage, step by step, until something happened, you know, like someone uh, took off, cut off uh, the pipe of air. So, да, такое впечатление, что просто кто-то нажал на кнопку, И вот журнал стал менее видимым для всех, чем ранее. So the total impression is like, you know, someone just pushed the red button and uh, the journal um, became less visible in the area of Facebook. И вот мы стали разбираться в этом вопросе, потому что явно нигде не написано, почему такое может случиться. That's the reason we decided to make a short investigation and find out the reason, because, you know, nothing happens without reason. Да, и выяснилось, что несколько материалов, которые мы размещали на странице Гранита науки, которые были даже не нашего авторства, они э, оказались помеченными как содержащие ложь или частичную ложь. And uh, actually, what did they find out in this short investigation? There were certain publications, certain scientific articles that were marked as fake content article or partly fake content article. However, actually, these were not the publications made by journalists of Granite of Science. These were the materials that were sent to the uh, editor, editorial board of Granite of Science. Да, и мы стали разбираться, что же общего в этих статьях, и выяснили, что их объединяет тема COVID. Of course, the main question was what uh, what is common for all these marked publication, and the common thing is only one: the main issue or the topic. This is COVID nineteen. Да, первая публикация это было видео видео обращение немецкого доктора права. Он является членом коллегии адвокатов Калифорнии и Германии одновременно, и он в своем видео обращении обосновывал, почему организаторы, собственно, этой пандемии должны отправиться под трибунал. Он это обосновывал нормами права. So the first publication marked as fake or partly fake was the video report of a certain um, solicitor. He is the man of law. Actually, he is a master in law or doctor in law. I believe, yeah, he's doctor in law, and also he is a part of uh, Los Angeles uh, legal scientific com uh, legal community. And his video was all about COVID-19 and the reason uh, people who organized COVID-19 pandemics should be uh, should be undergone by tribunal or set in prison. And he verified and argumented his opinion using the legal notions. И вот такая аномальная реакция была на видеообращение человека, который является действующим адвокатом, который входит в коллегию адвокатов Калифорнии и Германии, и который действительно глубоко занимается этой проблематикой. 
So that was like the social uh, social network response to the video report of a real solicitor, real advocate who is uh, the part of uh, uh, legal community of Los Angeles or journalist. I mean, this is the professional. This is the real professional who is living his life in law, and he is totally great expert in law activities. However, that was the result. Второй материал это было обращение бельгийских врачей и медработников примерно по той же тематике. Они требовали проведения открытых дебатов, где будут представлены все эксперты без какой-либо цензуры, потому что их не устраивали действия политиков, которые начались в связи с ковидом. Uh, the video uh, report of uh, uh, doctors from uh, from Belgium. Actually, these people were asking for a certain um, event for open air debates, open air no censorship debates that would involve all experts from many fields. Because actually these people, I mean, the doctors, the real people who are facing all this COVID-19 situation and dealing with it from within, they were dissatisfied with the political issues and with all the events that actually are getting around this COVID-19. И знаете, нам стало непонятно, это что, это шутка какая-то, кто прислал себе право называть ложью выступление адвоката и выступление медработников, которые, собственно, находятся в гуще событий, являются непосредственными очевидцами того, что происходит действительно в связи с covid -19. And actually, we were highly and extremely excited because actually it, it was like some sort of specific astonishment because you know what, is that even a true or is it a joke? Who actually has any right to claim or to label this is true and this is not true? Who had the right to label the report of a real professional uh, legal expert or doctors and to label them as fake? И сейчас я подойду к самому интересному. Выяснилось, что у Facebook а существует ряд партнеров. Это такие агентства, которые в каждой стране, видимо, на основании заключенных договоров с Facebook а мы не разбирались в юридических особенностях. Они вот проводят на территории разных стран работу по фильтрации того, что такое правда, а что такое неправда. И одно из таких агентств называется Vox Ukraine. So the most significant part of the speech of uh, our journalist colleague. So um, as far as this short journalistic investigation uh, helped to reveal that actually Facebook uh, have deals with certain so-called media agencies partners. And in Ukraine, there is such a partner. Uh, can you please call, name Box, it once again? Vox Ukraine. Ukraine. This is the media agency partner who maybe we believe actually that's logical to conclude that maybe they share some sort of contract or something like this. And on the basis of this contract, certain people uh, think they have the right to filter certain information and label some publication as true and correct ones and whilst neglecting the others as the fake ones. И вот мы стали читать их сайт и просто из открытых источников поняли, что это крайне сомнительное само по себе агентство, поскольку в его штате где-то 5 или 6 довольно молодых людей, за спинами которых стоят люди, которые являются авторитетами, ну, возможно, в своих компаниях, возможно, на своих факультетах, но уж точно не в масштабах всей страны в целом. И за спинами уже этих людей Стоят, стоит некий координационный совет, куда входит даже вот Нобелевский лауреат. Well, the main idea is as follows. This media agency actually is not a great, it's not a great deal or big thing. Actually, there are just several youngsters who are working over there. These are just young people. They're not like top level experts or something like that. Uh, behind these youngsters, there are certain a little bit more authoritative figures who are maybe authoritative somewhere in the universities or on the faculties. However, when I'm speaking about the notion of authoritiveness, this is like the local small authoritiveness level. This is not like authoritiveness for the European Union area, right? 
And then we do not only have youngsters or these small authorities. We have a special board of people uh, among, amidst which there are so, several uh, really great figures like Nobel Prize winners and the others. И вот что касается Нобелевского лауреата, я хочу напомнить, что это точно такие же люди, как мы с вами, и они тоже могут ошибаться. Но, видимо, это группа людей, которая с моей личной точки зрения не является ничем больше, чем симулякром. Мы знаем этот термин очень хорошо по предыдущим конференциям. И, собственно, они ввели Нобелевского лауреата, чтобы все сразу же начали бояться и сразу же преклонили головы в почтении перед истиной, которую глаголит как Нобелевский лауреат, так и вся вот эта вот группа людей, стоящая перед ним. And you know, right now we were speaking about such a figure, right, like the Nobel Prize winner. Um, the speaker is emphatic about the fact that the Nobel Prize winner is a human being. He is a person, as usual as we all are. And since we are all people, we all actually make mistakes. And even the Nobel Prize winner may, may make mistakes. However, the same as the notion of Nobel Prize winner amidst all this editorial board correspondence of people who label something with fake or true, he is just a person who was invited for the specific reason. Because, you know, when all the rest of the crowd or the rest of publicity, they hear like the Nobel Prize winner, they imagine huge, uh, great things and they, they should like gasp uh, with a breath of fresh air and say, oh my God, this is the Nobel Prize winner. We should definitely listen to him. But this is just like a part of show that's called a simulacra. Да, и просто представьте себе, уважаемые ученые, что будет, если уже эта ситуация есть. Вот вы сегодня что-то делаете, что-то исследуете, а завтра просто на это поставят клейму. Ложь или частичная ложь. И сделает это какая-то не, вообще непонятная комиссия по этике и эстетике. Я не знаю, что это за организация, собственно. И... Они будут вам говорить, как жить, что такое хорошо, что такое плохо. Никто не спросит ваших научных выкладок и просто ставят клеймо и все. And the main idea is actually for all of us to think about and to reflect is as follows. Dear colleagues, dear scholars and scientists, everyone who is making your job with your soul. I mean, you are all are scientists and you're doing your scientific research and you're sharing your results with the rest of the people. Just try to imagine the real state of things. Right now you are doing something, but at the same time, somewhere there are certain people, we, we, no one knows these people, who think that they have the right just to label the results of your scientific activity with either a fake label or partly fake label disregarding all your monographs, all your scientific publications, etc. They just label without even reading what you do. Да, и безусловно, Гранит науки будет проводить расследования. Мы уже выяснили несколько фигур, которые стоят за этими организациями. Странным образом, они все связаны с фондом Джорджа Сороса. And as a matter of fact, we are go, uh, the journalists of uh, the scientific and popular uh, journal Granite of Science, they're going to conduct a journalistic investigation. However, to be, to be honest, this investigation has already started and several figures were already found out. And we should say like, um, the, this is just the beginning of the story, just the beginning of the investigation. However, a pretty, pretty significant, uh, well, <laughs> fact is that all the people who already are found amidst this Labelers, let me say so. They are somehow connected with the Soros Fund. Да, и я думаю, это очевидно, что происходящее противоречит всем принципам свободы слова, вот свободы вероисповедания, свободы. Да вообще, это попрание всех международных прав. And of, I, uh, the speaker believes that actually this is like the obvious uh, situation that pushes us to conclude that things we're seeing right now, this is the total, let me say, distortion of all freedoms. Like, you know, all freedoms are 
like the freedom of speech, the freedom of belief, etc. Like people just don't care for all your freedoms and all things that you do. And this is like great uh, international um, problem. That's the point. Да, я заключить хочу тем, что спорить, обсуждать, научно исследовать. Там ведь были материалы научного исследования в наших публикациях. Но все это делать вам запрещают. Вам не место в Фейсбуке, если вы это собираетесь делать. Вы теперь Джордана Бруно. Ваши труды подлежат сожжению одним простым нажатием кнопки. Если кто-то решил, что Земля плоская, значит она не должна вращаться. Все. And to conclude, our speaker is actually bright and suspicious. She says that, well, the only thing we scholars should realize that it doesn't matter what we are doing in our monographs, in our scientific publications, because somewhere there are people who just think they can push the red button and make you burn in fire, just like Giordano Bruno somehow, somehow was like. Okay, so we all right now are just like these Giordano Bruno uh, um, followers, and it doesn't matter what we do in case someone thinks that well, today I want to feel like the Earth, the, our planet Earth, it's not a round one, but it's a flat one. And then there are certain people who say, no, I don't like this idea. It's not a flat one. You are banned. So actually there are people who even try to believe and try to persuade the others that they can decide what's right and what's wrong and who is going to be the next Giordano Bruno. И это, уважаемые ученые, очень опасный прецедент на которые я прошу, я как главный редактор европейского научно-популярного издания, прошу вас всех обратить внимание. Благодарю. And the most significant issue or the total conclusion overall is about the fact this is a very dangerous precedent and that's uh, since it is really internationally dangerous one because you're not allowed to share your scientific results in the social area since it is controlled by some other people that's why the editor-in-chief of granite, granite of science journal is sharing this information with all of us thanks for your attention okay so by this dear colleagues let me please finalize our third day of online panel. So I believe today we had a peculiar discussion. Thank you for all your speeches. Thank you for all your reports. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you for being honest. Uh, I believe that actually questions that were discussed today, they're not, they're complex. They're not the easy one. No, it's not like that. And actually special thanks for your courage. Uh, for the way you, are, you spoke, for the way you shared your ideas and did that in a sophisticated manner. So by this, let me say you're welcome. Tomorrow we're going to have one more online conference panel. Thank you so much for your kind attention and see you soon. Good luck. Be safe. Goodbye. <laughs>